Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, we are still in our series, um, and today our topic is uh, called to generosity. So we're looking at money today. And um, Jesus spent 25% of his time talking about money or possessions. That's a lot of time, isn't it? And, and as a church, we only spend three preaches roughly a year, so one a term, talking about these subjects. So we don't talk about this an awful lot, and we probably should talk about it more. Every time that I speak on this topic, I am acutely aware, coming into this, that some of us in the room will be going through financial difficulty, and some of us will be living in financial plenty. We are all going to be in different positions with this. And depending on the background that we have as Christians, we might have different views. Maybe you were brought up in a church that believed one thing, and that you, you have been taught a certain way of looking at certain scriptures. And so you come into this with one opinion, and then there'll be other people on the other side of it have been taught something different. We come into this conversation with different teaching, maybe, as Christians. And if you've become a Christian here, then there is a real, it's really important that we teach you well about money. And I'm also aware, lastly on this, that the church hasn't done well on this globally. There, there are people in the, the global body of Christ who have brought Jesus' teaching into disrepute on the subject of money. And so when a pastor stands up at church and says, we're going to talk about money today, if you're cynical, you'll go, he just wants more money. That'll be the attitude. Because I, if I was in your position, I'd be going, here we go again, the pastor wants money. Genuinely, that is not my heart. My heart in this is that if Jesus taught on money and possessions, 25% of his ministry was spent talking about those things. As a pastor, I need to teach you about this. As a pastor, I need to teach you what God thinks about finances and, and how God wants you to approach finances. We need to teach you these things. This is important. And so that's my attitude with this today. We are going to finish with our offering today as a response for you. It's not so, I'm genuinely, I just being really want to be really candid and open about it. I felt it was the best way to finish the meeting today. Um, but I just really want to just really lay that out. I'm not, this is not a, a plea for more money. Speaking to some of you, I know that some of our church experiences of money or of church and how they, how they treat the topic of money have included coming into the church and before you even enter the building, there are offering buckets outside for various offerings that you need to give into, apparently. Being chased around the building by leaders for your tithe. Being taught that if you give, you will financially get more. Going to churches where there are cash machines in the worship space. It's true, this happens. This is like quite normal for quite a, like in lots of different places. Never being taught about money or challenged. See, the, 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 the danger is, is because we, we, we can be reactive, right? So cr Christian leaders can be reactive. And so they see the uh, excesses, the, the cash machines in the church buildings, and they think, oh, I, don't, I, don't know, I won't talk, talk about money at all. But that's just as bad. <laughs> it's just as bad as, as the other thing. So we come to this with lots of different things. We also come into this conversation today knowing just how important money is. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I love politics. I really love politics. And so now that the election's over, I don't know what to do with myself because, <laughs> I listen, I, if you want to talk to me about a podcast to do with politics, I will tell you about it. Um, I think I'm now going to get interested in the French elections just to give me something to think about. Um, but our election was paid out, it was, sorry, it was played out with a, a background of the financial um, kind of cost of living crisis and the, the main parties was all about tax. It was, it was a, a central part of what was being kind of spoken about. Our bank balances, our incomes and our outgoings affect so many parts of our lives that this is such a big thing. So this has been in the, it's in the public psyche, but it's also in our personal kind of journey as well. We, we think about money a lot. And when Jesus speaks about money, his key message is that how we use and view money is really a matter of our allegiance. Our allegiance. Do we follow money or do we follow God, says Jesus. Jesus actually called money mammon or mammonas in, in, in the Greek. And, and that literally means, Greek to English translation, it's a treasure you place your trust in. So he didn't just call it money. Whenever, you know, he referred to money as a treasure you place your trust in. Money is something that we can put our trust in and it becomes like a God to us, like mammon. 
Um, we've just had my niece who lives out in the States staying with us. And a few weeks ago, Jude, my son and I, we were having a conversation about the fact that um, every country in the world has different currency. So those of you who've watched Bluey, as like if you've got young kids, if you haven't got young kids, it's just brilliant anyway. Um, but they have dollar bucks in this program. So he wanted to know what dollars were. Um, and so I asked my sister to send me some American money over, and she's so generous, she sent me a one dollar note. Um, <laughs> But I'd forgotten that on a $1 note is the words, in God we trust. In God we trust. Isn't it like kind of almost ironic and, and an oxymoron? <laughs> at the centre of capitalism, at the centre of a, a, a world culture that promotes the, 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 like the profit of your own individual bank account, is on their dollar bill, the foundation of their currency, in God we trust. See, the question that Jesus presents us with is what or who are we placing our trust in? He consistently sought to challenge not only his disciples, but also those in the wider society around him regarding people's views about money. And one such piece of teaching is the parable of the shrewd manager in Luke 16. So if you've got a Bible, that's where we're going to be today. But before we get there, I just want to give you a caveat to this. I did not want to preach on this passage. I kept saying to God, God, stop leading me back to this passage. This is the most complicated parable Jesus tells. And so I'm going to do my best today at helping to expand this and expound this for you and help you show you what Jesus is getting at. But this is complicated because we could misinterpret this quite easily if we're not careful. So we're going to start from verse 1 of chapter 16, and I'm reading from the NIV today. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and he asked him, what's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, well, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly, says Jesus. Okay, so let's stop there. We'll go back to the rest of it in a minute. So here we have this dishonest manager, as he gets called, who for reasons Jesus doesn't elaborate on at the start of the parable, is accused of wasting his boss's assets. His actions, or inactions, we don't know, starts a review with the boss, with this rich man. And we know that this review is going to have one result at the end of it. The, the, the manager is going to lose his job. And in the midst of this personal crisis for the manager, he makes some decisions. He thinks beyond the end of his current employment and seeks to gain favour with the people who owe his boss money. Now, at first reading, if you just read this plainly, what he does seems a little bit shady, doesn't it? Why would Jesus tell a story about somebody who seems dishonest? He seemingly removes part of the debt these people owe the boss. I mean, if that was me, I'd be really cross, wouldn't you? Imagine that. Oh, yeah, well... It they owe me 100 quid and you only get 80 back. You'd be cross about it. Well, when we read the parables, we have to remind ourselves, and this is not just true of the parables, actually. It's true of all of the Bible. The Bible was written thousands of years ago. And whilst we advocate a plain reading of the Bible, as in we can understand what the Bible means, we have to understand the Bible's written into a cultural context. It's not our culture. <laughs> it's a different culture. And so we have to understand a little bit about what was going on in that culture in order to understand this parable. So what is this, is this parable about? Well, there are lots of different ideas that float around, but here's one and the one that I, I hold to uh, regarding what is going on here. In the first century, the, the, there, amongst Jews, there was a forbidden practice called usury. Usury was the overcharging of interest. So high levels of interest on what money that you owed. And God had actually forbidden this practice in the Old Testament among Jews, but they got round God's law, because they did that a lot. And they came up with a workaround. The workaround was, rather than charging usury on money, they charged it on goods. They charged it on goods. So um, instead of me owing you £100, well, I owe you 100 bushels of wheat, yeah? 
But it wasn't just that. It was, well, actually, you owe me 200 bushels a week. It's been five days. You owe me even more money. That's usury. So any of us who have got caught in payday loans um, or high-interest credit cards, that's usury. And God doesn't like it. It's not good. So the manager in this story is a debt collector for this rich landowner who himself is corrupt. He's charging usury on his land. Imagine for a moment if this was now in the UK today. Imagine this landowner is like a, a farm owner and he owns loads of land. Enough actually that he can divvy his land out and sublet it out to other people. And these people hire the land and he overcharges them extreme interest on the land he is um, hiring them. This story then is not told to promote dishonest working practices, but instead to use resources that we've been given shrewdly, decisively, and with generosity. The, the manager is commended by the landowner for his forward thinking. And Jesus points to this manager and says the right way to handle money is to behave like a forward thinking steward, somebody who acts decisively with what we've been given. You see, we're managed. We're called to manage what God has entrusted to us. And we see this pattern throughout the Old Testament and into the New as well, that everything we have doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. So the first time we see this is in the Garden of Eden. God owns the Garden of Eden, and he creates Adam and Eve, and he makes them gardeners to tend for what he owns. They're his gardeners. Then we see this in Leviticus, Leviticus 25, verse 23. God tells the Israelites, as they enter Canaan, as they're in Canaan, he says to them, you are to be tenants in my land. It never belong, doesn't belong to them. It belongs to God. They're tenants in the land. God owns the land. We see this in the Psalms. He's the one who owns a cattle of a thousand hills. And we also see the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything belongs to God. And we are stewards of what he owns. In the New Testament, we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And Paul actually goes a step further. He says it's not just about other things. You yourself belong to God. If you're a Christian, Paul says to you, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Paul says, look, your bodies belong to God. He's entrusted them to you. You're to steward wisely what he's given you. Therefore, honour God with it. The good principle. As Christians, we are called to steward the world that God has entrusted to us. We've done that so badly, haven't we? That's why we've got a, you know, a global crisis in terms of the, the climate, because we've not stewarded what God's created. We're also called to steward our bodies that he claims ownership over. Like the manager in our story who was entrusted with his boss's land, everything you and I have is not yours, it's God's. We're stewards. It's what Jesus is getting at in this story. And secondly, we're called to an attitude of generosity. If you are in Christ, we teach on this a lot, you keep needing to hear this, you are a son or a daughter of Father God. We, we, we have to keep working away from performance mentality. I need to get God to like me more. We have to keep living into a mentality that God is our Father and we are his sons and daughters. And Romans 8 says that the Spirit empowers us and testifies to us that we have been adopted as children of God. And when we read Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, peace, Faithfulness, self-control. Well, the fruit of the Spirit are the characteristics of God. The fruit of the Spirit, the characteristics of God. As the Spirit works in our life, what he does is he makes us more like Father God. The Spirit's work in our lives is, is to, 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 to be that voice in our lives that cries out, Abba, Father, I belong, to the fa I belong to the Father as a son or daughter. But his role is also to produce fruit in us that we might be like God, that we might be children of the Father. Jesus, alongside using this story to show us that we are stewards, just like the, um, the, the manager is a steward, Jesus is also teaching us something else, and it's, like a, he's, it's a comparison. It's a comparison. He's teaching us something about the character of Father God through this rich landowner. You see, our father is not like the landowner in this story. Notice where this parable, where does this parable come? What's, what's the end of Luke 15? Anybody want to just look at their Bible and tell me? What's the story, the end of Luke 15? The lost son. At the end of the parable of the lost son is a father who delights to welcome his son back. 
And in that story, there's an older brother who is really angry about this. Jesus makes a comparison between the older brother and himself, and he says, I'm not like the older brother. In this story, he's making a comparison between Father God and the rich landowner. God is not a God who overcharges interest. God is not that type of God. God is the God who gives generously and freely. Jesus is making a comparison for us that we need to see. He's the same father that we see in the prodigal son story who generously welcomes the son back into his house. Can you see that the comparison is there? John says to us, chapter 3 of John's gospel, the father gives the spirit without limit. We receive freely from the father both salvation, both our adoption as sons and daughters, but also we we receive the spirit freely. He wants us to become like him. If you're a Christian, God wants you to become like the Father. Not taking or expecting more like the rich landowner, but giving freely. Our Father is constantly entrusting us with what we have and watching over how we use it. What you've got in your bank account today has been entrusted to you by God and he's watching you. Watching how you're going to use it. And it's not like an overbearing boss, micromanaging everything you do, checking your emails every day to make sure you're doing your job. It's not like that. It's like a father watching their children to see what they do. It's the delight of the father in you, not an overbearing boss who's going to be cross with you. But it's a delight of the father to go, have they got it yet? Do they understand my generosity? Are they going to start behaving like me? Does that make sense? That's how God sees you. He's looking for those moments. Yes, you've got it. You've got my generosity. You see, we're called to generous stewardship of what God has given us to demonstrate the generous generosity of our Father. So Jesus then goes on to teach this. And he says this from verse 8 be onwards. So we're back in our text again in Luke 16. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus says the people of the world care about their physical well-being and their future. We've seen this played out in the, the election campaigns. Just like the manager in the parable, he cares about his future. And he knows that we, as those who are no longer of this world... If you're a Christian, you do not belong to the systems of this world. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. But we who belong to the kingdom of heaven should give similar care and attention to our spiritual well-being and our spiritual future. Like the manager who stewards his money to ensure his future financial security, Jesus teaches us that we should steward our money today with an eye on our eternal future. Our mindset today is to steward wisely, not only for tomorrow in the natural, that's a good thing to do, but also for the day when we find ourselves in heaven with Jesus or here when he returns to make all things new. You see, we need to live our lives now in light of our future with God. And if our future is to be spent in the presence of the generous Father who gives freely to all without finding fault, we need to spend what we have today generously demonstrating the Father to others. You see, when your end comes, says Jesus, will you have acted with a similar foresight to the man in the parable seeing the money you have now as an investment for your eternal future. This is something Jesus continually says. He says it in Matthew 6, famous passage. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and when thieves break in and steal. Let's put a bit of context back into that again. They didn't have banks the way we have banks. If you saved your wages, you put it under your bed or you put it in a jar on the side in your house. And then you come along the next day and find that moths have eaten it all or somebody's crept into your house and stolen it. Jesus says, don't behave like that. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There is future eternal reward and blessing waiting for each one of us as we enter Christ's kingdom in heaven. 
How we spend, save, use money now impacts a reward we will receive then. Now, there are lots of people who try and make big theologies out of this, but you can't do it because the Bible is silent beyond that. We just need to listen to what Jesus is saying and say, no, there is, there is a, future, a future reward if I honor God with my finances. I can't tell you and elaborate on what all that will be, but I know that Jesus teaches us it. Jesus also teaches us that God will not entrust us with the significant spiritual gifts of the kingdom if we cannot be faithful or trustworthy in handling the worldly wealth of this world, doesn't he? He says, God's not going to entrust you with, the, with true riches unless you handle the riches of this world. The amount of money you have now is not as important as what you do with it. Are your money and possessions directed towards yourself or stewarded generously as a demonstration of the kingdom of God towards other people? Because ultimately, says Jesus, this boils down to the question, where is your allegiance? What is your heart set on? The things of the world or on the kingdom of God? And there's an invitation in this passage to us to turn our allegiance back over to Jesus. Our parable starts with the manager knowing he cannot change the dishonest ways that he behaved yesterday, but he can act shrewdly and wisely with the money now to impact his tomorrow. He can't change yesterday. He's done. He's going to lose his job. It's gone. But he can change his tomorrow. You and I cannot change how we previously used money. Maybe if you bought something yesterday, you can take it back. <laughs> but we can't change how we've managed money, mismanaged money, got ourselves into debt. But we can change how we approach money from this point forward. See, we live under grace. We don't live under law. Yeah, We, we can change tomorrow. We can think about how we use money today. We can look at our bank accounts now in the light of today and say, well, how am I going to use this money, the money that God's entrusted to me? It's important that we think about it as a future thing and not a past thing, just the way that this man does in our story. You and I can't change how we've previously used money, but we can consider how we'll use money in the future. And doing this is not something that we can just kind of like verbally say or acknowledge. Yeah, Jesus doesn't God's not looking for us just to pay lip service to what he teaches us. He's looking for us to do it. He's looking for us to step out in faith. As a father watches their child, you know, when a child walks for the first time or gets on a bike for the first time or does something for the first time, actually the father's looking to us as his children and he's saying, go on, you can do it. You can do it. Be generous like I'm generous. You can do it. Be free from the power of mammon. Be generous the way that I am generous. Practically then, how could we grow, as Jesus says, how could we grow in trustworthiness in God as generous stewards of what he's given us? And I think there are three ways that we find in scripture. The first is giving our first fruits to the king. So I believe that scripture teaches both in the Old Testament and in the New, I don't think it changes in this way, that God, there's, uh, our, every, if everything we have belongs to God, actually there's a principle that we see throughout the Bible that we give the first fruits to the king. This is a response of the heart to say, God, I seek your kingdom first. God, everything I have is yours. Some call this tithing. Um, and I don't think that's helpful. Because for some of us, 10% is a, an awful lot that we're still growing on faith journey for. And others of us, 10% is nothing. And so it's an attitude of the heart. So I would always talk about it being a proportional gift to God. Proportionally, out of your earnings that you've received, what's your first fruit that you want to give back to God? as an act of worship to him, as an act of demonstrating I believe in a generous father. Every month I give, Claire and I, my wife and I, give 10% of our money to God as an act of worship. And, and notice this distinction. I, we genuinely, as a leadership team, we do not believe that when you give money here, you give it to Gateway. You're giving it as an act of worship to Father God. And then it's our response as wise stewards of what's been given to honour God with it and to make sure it's invested in seeing the kingdom of God outworked in our community. That's, what, that's how I see money. I hold this responsibility sometimes too heavily and I have to remember that Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light because we want to be responsible with it. To see how many churches dishonour with money. We need to hold this very, very sensibly and want to honour God with it. So first of all, give your first fruits into the king and his kingdom. Secondly, a way that we can learn the generosity of the Father is to be generous with those in the church. So when the early church starts in Acts 2, 
We have them giving to one another as they see needs. And then by Acts 4, as the church is getting more and more established, and they're really learning one another's needs, we see people in the church community selling their houses and selling plots of land to meet the needs of poorer brothers and sisters in the church community. It's how we're first introduced to Barnabas in the Bible. Barnabas sells a plot of land, and he takes the proceeds, and he lays it at the apostles' feet. We're called to be those who are generous to those in the church, that where we see a need, we meet it. And so like our church is incredible with this. People are often giving gifts to one another secretly where people don't know, or publicly, you know, I oh, want God told me to give you this, or making meals for one another, or generous in terms of our time, I'll help you move house, or generous in terms of our time, I'll look after your kids, or generous in terms of our time, let me help you do your garden. We're generous. But we can keep being more generous. We can keep growing in a, in a walk of generosity with those in the church community. Thirdly, we're called to steward the Father's generosity to those outside the kingdom. This is so important that we learn we're called to be those who demonstrate what the Father is like to the society around us. What would it look like for you this week to be generous towards somebody who does not know Jesus? So I've been thinking over the last couple of weeks, I've I feel like the Holy Spirit's trying to kind of encourage me towards doing it, but I'm still trying to figure out a way that I can do this, um, which is I want to pay for somebody for something, like whether it's in front of me in a queue or behind me in a queue. So I'm going to wait for that moment, and God's going to show me who it's for, and I'm going to do it, because God's been speaking to me about it. So I'll tell you when I've done it, but I feel that's what God's teaching me on this. And I, as we, I was preparing this message, I said to Claire, Claire, we need to, we need to have a chat about our money again, because we need to take a step forward with our generosity. Because every time you start being more generous, God goes, be more generous again. It, it doesn't stop. <laughs> Keep being generous. So we need to go away and we're going to have a conversation. We've, we, we just, uh, let's, we'll have a chat about how we can be generous with what God's given us again. But that's for me. For me this week, I'm going to look for that opportunity. What could you do this week to show the Father's generosity to somebody around you? How could you steward the Father's generosity to those outside the kingdom and in doing so, as Jesus says in this story, we want to make friends of those outside the kingdom that they might know Jesus and be brought into the kingdom. I want to use my money to demonstrate the generous father and to demonstrate the heart of a gospel of a God who gives freely, that people might know and meet Jesus. How could you do that this week? So they're the practical things, practical challenges for you, things to think about in your life. And this isn't the sort of uh, preach normally where there would be a, a kind of like, um, you know, a, a response in it, a way that we might want to pray for people. But I do feel that there are two groups of people this morning that I do feel God wants to just speak to. Um, as I was preparing this, I just felt God leading me towards this. I feel like, I mean, this is an obvious one, but there's a few people here. I really feel your allegiance is misplaced. And as I've been speaking to you about this this morning, the Holy Spirit has just been speaking to you about your misplaced allegiances with money. Like if you were to get that dollar bill out, it would say, in this note I trust, I need the money. I just feel like we've been, we, it, funny, you know, how these things all fit together, but, you know, Pete, uh, sorry, Fran uh, led on that uh, break every chain this morning. I, I just really feel that there's an opportunity for some of us to be free from that this morning, to be free from that allegiance in our heart towards money. And we can do that as we just turn towards Jesus again and say, Jesus, you're king. So I want to pray for you in a minute. That's the first group. And maybe if you're in debt, I just really encourage you, if you are in debt and you're really struggling with it, please come and speak to us about it. We'd love to talk to you about that. We've got people in the church who can help you manage and talk to you about budgeting. And um, we'd want to walk with you and stand with you in that. I know that for some of us, debt is a huge thing. And we want to we wanna be helping you with that um, practically in, in offering you ways of you know, money, budgeting, and all those types of things. The second group, um, I just felt, as I was preparing this, like... Yesterday, last night, as I was going through it, there's, there's, there's people here who you're just gifted at making money. You are. You're gifted at making money. It's like you do something and all of a sudden you make money out of it. And you're not in allegiance to money. It's not like it's an act of worship for you to make money. In fact, you know how to steward the money well into the kingdom. And you've been faithful with what God's given you. I just really felt there was like a con commendation from the Father over your life today. It was like a well done so you'll know who you are, because you'll have money. <laughs> and you'll know that you're giving it away. But I just felt God wanted to say well done to you, whoever you are this morning. But I also feel that there's going to be a season where God's going to entrust you more. Because it's what Jesus teaches us in this. And when he entrusts you with more, I, 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 I kind of was saying, God, what's that going to look like? 
might be a new job, might be inheritance money, it might be a, a, a salary increase. When you get the more, it's not a celebration to say, yeah, I've got more money, I'm going to go on holiday with it. But it's actually, God, what, the, the response from you at that point in time is, God, what do you want me to do with that money? How could I sow this back into the kingdom? Maybe it's giving it away to somebody in need. Maybe it's giving it away to uh, things that are going on here or through the church into other places. Maybe it's those things. But there'll be a, a response, and you're, you're going to need to, at, at that point in time, say, God, what do you want me to do with this? How could I show your generosity to others? Um, so let's pray, shall we, as we finish this morning. And after we do that, I felt a good response to this was to take up an offering. But I've, I kind of I realised in the first meeting, it could look like I'm just asking you to give more. I'm, I'm not. It's just a response of the heart to say, God, I just want, like, everything I have is yours. So we're going to do that after we finish in a minute. But let's just pray, shall we? Oh, Father, I thank you that everything we have comes from you. Thank you that you're the one who gives freely to all without finding fault. Father, thank you that you don't just call us slaves, but you call us sons and daughters. Thank you that you've sent your spirit into our hearts. Holy Spirit, we thank you that it's you who testifies with our spirit and, and calls out from within us, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Thank you that we can call you Dad. Father God, we thank you we are your sons and your daughters. We thank you that we don't sit here as hired hands, but we sit here as sons and daughters. Thank you you're not an overbearing landowner who charges with extra interest, but Lord, you give freely to all. Thank you, Father. Thank you that as your spirit works in our lives, we become more like you. And we become more generous the way that you're generous. And so, Holy Spirit, we just ask for you to fill us now. That we might become more generous. That we might be like you. Father, I pray for anyone here today who knows that their allegiance towards these things is an allegiance towards money and not towards God. Just stand with them now. Just We stand with them as brothers and sisters. And we just proclaim freedom over them today. Freedom and release from that today, we pray. Lord, that people would be released from that and, and just turn again to you, Jesus, and say, Jesus, you're my king. Jesus, I serve you with everything I have, including what's in my pockets. Jesus, everything I have is yours. So I pray you'd help my brothers and sisters to step out in that, but also spiritually be released from any power that money might have over people. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our church community. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have got a generous community here. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be more generous. Lord, we want it said about us. Lord, we want people in the local community to gossip about our church and say, in that church community, nobody seems to be in need. Lord, we want to demonstrate what it looks like to the world around us, what it means to love one another and be your disciples. And Lord, we ask you that out of the generosity that you put into our lives, that there would be an overflow, not only to the, 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 the local community, but to be communities elsewhere as well, that we could be a witness to the world and demonstrate your generosity. So Father, we ask you that you'd lead us in these things in the season to come. Amen.